Well, um, R Rob uh, started off by mentioning the uh, shortest poem in history by uh, Muhammad Ali, Me, We. Um, I want to make reference to the shortest speech in history, which Salvador Dali apparently stood up at Harvard with one of these commencement speeches, and he said, my speech is so short, it is already finished. And then he sat down. Well, I'm not going to be quite that short, but I will be uh, shortish. Um, I sent the, I, I wrote up a document. I, I assume it'll be available at some point. So if you want to find the subtle details of my argument, look to the, look to the written copy. Um, I do want to speak about the economic and financial crisis. Um, I want to say a few words about uh, economic policies that I think um, are not going to get us out of this. And those are the economic policies that we've been following. Um, and then I want to say a few words about policies that I think will work or could work to get us out of it. Um, but those policies, and this point of my presentation plays into everything you've heard today about the multidisciplinary thing. Um, all of the policies that could work run into the problem posed by what I call, rather flippantly, uh, the should, could, and would problems. The should problem is what are the policies that economic theory tells us would work to get us out of this mess? That's one level. The second level is the could. Do you have the powers to do the things that need to be done to get us out of this mess? And thirdly, you have the would element, okay, which the will to act philosophers have been talking about for generations. You know what you ought to do. You got the power to do it, but are you going to do it? And the answer is very frequently not. And we've got, to get, we've got to get over all of those to actually get out of this, get out of this mess. Um, before I turn to that, let me just say very briefly, and this is assertion, okay? This is assertion. What is the nature of the problem that we want to get out of? And the answer is we have a debt problem. And Reinhard Rogoff, uh, uh, Sulerich and Taylor, the IMF, the BIS, I mean, so many people have looked into this. This is a crisis which differs in some respects from previous crises, but it's like 1874 and 1929 in Japan, and we've seen this many, many times before. This particular crisis is a debt crisis. And I would have to say, however, that it has been augmented in its magnitude by the exchange rate relationships that are lying behind it. So that when one thinks about the global debt crisis, the United States, okay, they spent too much at home, uh, uh, they, 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 they got into big problems, they had a bust, and so you try to ease your policies and your exchange rate should go down. Right? But unfortunately, the Chinese and the Japanese and virtually everybody else you can think about said, if you can print the money to get your exchange rate to go down to solve your debt problem, Okay, to stop your currency, sorry, to, to depreciate your currency, we have got the same capacity to print the money to prevent our exchange rates from going up. And that's precisely what they did. And that's really at the heart of what's, what's happened here. And Europe is exactly the same. Okay? You've, you've got a debt problem too, which arises from the same source, which is excess credit and excess debt that's built up in the peripheral, and now you're going to have to sort it out in a cooperative way, but unfortunately, without being able to use the exchange rate. Well, there's the debt problem. We've got to solve it, and I'll turn to the policies. But I did want to make two introductory points that I think are very important. One of them is, and I know this doesn't fly so well in Berlin, this debt problem is primarily a private sector debt problem. Okay, it's the global debt problem aroused from private sector behavior. The European problem has arisen from private sector behavior and excessive capital flows into the peripheral countries. So item number one, this is a private sector thing at heart. Secondly, the difficulties associated with debt have much to do with what the money was used for. So we have real side misallocations. We have balance sheets that are out of whack, imbalances on the real side, the household sector side. And the reason why I make these two points is there has been an inordinate, an immense amount of effort recently that's gone into questions of fiscal restraint in Europe or fiscal stability, let's put it that way, 
and into the search for financial stability. I'm not saying that those are wrong objectives. All I'm saying is that in the light of what I have just said, the immense emphasis put on those two things, it's been overemphasized, and we need to go back and get a bit more, bit more balance. Well, against that background, let me say a few words about uh, policy responses to date and their shortcomings. Um, I am sure that all of you have read the new book, Keynes Hayek. Uh, if not, you've certainly seen the rap about Keynes Hayek on the internet. The debate is on again, okay? The debate is on again. Why is that so? I think when the crisis first hit, the response was a typical Keynesian response, right? We lowered interest rates, we let the automatic stabilizers work, we did what needed to be done. It was a Keynesian response. And that was right in the one period Keynesian model. But lurking in the background is Hayek and all of the classical people who've got a multi-period model. We say, yeah, there's the short run, but then the question becomes what happens over time? And I guess I would suggest that Keynes and Hayek were both right. But Keynes was right earlier. So we had the Keynesian response, if you want to call it that, the war and fiscal expansion. We've used Keynesian policies over and over again ever since the war, the dominance of Canadian, Keynesian thinking. almost said Canadian thinking. <laughs> Keynesian thinking. But what was happening was that every time those Keynesian measures were used, those imbalances that Hayek was worried about were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And in effect, what has happened, we've now got to the point where we've used up all that Keynesian ammunition and it can be used no longer. Now, I won't go any further. I won't go into any details here about the, do we need more expansionary fiscal policy? I think in some cases the answer is yes, but I think in many other cases, in a sense what Hayek had worried about earlier on, the markets are now so spooked about the buildup of government debt, that any attempt to expand that government debt would immediately get retaliation from the markets, increases in credit spreads, making things worse. So in effect, what would happen is that expansionary fiscal, monetary, uh, fiscal policy would actually turn into contractionary fiscal policy. And that's where we're at in some countries. So when you get this debate about should we contract fiscal or should we expand fiscal, the reason why people take different views is because there is no right answer. And when people do come out and say, I have got a universal answer, they're working on the basis of belief as opposed to the basis of knowledge. I think monetary policy is similarly circumscribed. Okay, it's pretty obvious with interest rates at zero, QE and all that stuff is unproven ways to do things. Um, it's not at all obvious that what we're doing at the moment somehow can be expanded upon. And indeed, I think there's more and more people, and you can read my paper, more and more people coming out with what I think are very cogent arguments about why more monetary expansion can't work. And not least of it, I mean, this is ironical, comes from Alan Greenspan talking about headwinds. Because the headwinds are precisely the imbalances of debt that have built up over the years that prevent monetary policy from working in the end. And looking beyond the fact that I don't think monetary policy can be used any more extensively, I think we need a lot more emphasis on the downsides of what's going on here. And I think uh, you, you need to be a brave man to talk about it, but the fact of it is there are a lot of downsides. Do we have, are we gonna generate just another bubble, okay, to go at the end of the super, the, what did George Soros calls it, the super bubble that's been building up for 20 years? I think it's entirely possible. Um, these very low interest rates are penalizing pension funds and insurance companies. I speak to these people on a regular basis. They're petrified. They're petrified because they can't get the returns up to meet their obligations. So the low interest rate policy is buying tranquility today, potentially for disaster tomorrow. And I could go on and on, zombie companies, zombie banks, the, the, you know, the list, is, the list is endless. We should at least be talking about the longer run negative implications of all of this. 
And I would lastly say, although I don't agree with 100% with what the, the, the Bundesbank is saying here, there has got to be some risk of rising inflation and all this. And I know that people who, who run their, their, their economic policy off the gap, okay, they say we've got a big unemployment gap, it's impossible. You know the line, I used it here two years ago, even an economist, when he sees something happen, will admit it is possible. <laughs> Go back to Latin America, where the sort of monetary mechanism fed straight into inflationary expectations. And in a world of fiscal dominance, which I think we, we have in many countries, it is not impossible that this kind of phenomena would occur. So, current policies. I'm, I'm wor I think we've got to the end of the line here. What else can we do? What else can we do? Is this just a, a statement of, of uh, there is no hope, we're all doomed? I, I hope not. I think there's a lot of things that can be done, and I'll mention them here briefly, but they all come up against, when you think about it, the could, well, the should, could, and would problem. I want people to think about things like more effective international macro cooperation, more explicit debt reduction, stronger fixed investment, both public and private, and lastly, structural reforms to improve growth prospects. But they all come up against those three constraints. Now, the should, the should constraint. We cannot convince people to follow new policies unless they're convinced that the old policies won't work, okay? Is there universal agreement that the old policies won't work? Absolutely not. Particularly, I would say, in Washington and particularly at the Fed, where the policy has been the same, more of the same, and still more of the same. So we have absolutely no agreement that will motivate a decision to move to something else, which is a problem. Um, the could problem, I think, has to do with powers. And it's already been mentioned here. At the national level, uh, we, don't, we don't have the, the nation state anymore where society was the nation state. That's easy to handle. Now we've got a pluralistic, rapidly changing, competing interest. The state has become more powerless than it's ever been before. And now we've got to add on to that all of the international dimension. And what I've observed in 20 or 30 years is one, people don't want to give up sovereignty, and we've, we've had this mentioned. And, and secondly, when they do give it up, uh, they take every opportunity that they can to interpret the deal in a way that's in their own national interest. So we, we've got a real problem at that level. And lastly, of course, in the political realm, um, to get cooperation at the political realm, uh, you do absolutely need to have um, trust, a sense of fairness, and unfortunately, as one looks at the world, you see that we're not moving in that direction. We're actually moving in a different direction. And one of the difficulties that's raised by the rise of countries, in particular like China, is how do you get effective cooperation with a regime that is basically not democratic, is partly party controlled, uh, who's got something like 20% of the world's billionaires associated with the party itself. How do we get into an effective cooperation in a, in a world like that? So anyway, I won't, I, uh, l l let me just say, International macroeconomic cooperation, could that help us? The, the basis of the deal is the Chinese should have a more domestic-led strategy, m more consumption spending. Basis of a deal is in the US, they have to do something about the fiscal side. Well, the Chinese don't want to do it because million, many, many people have made millions and millions of dollars from the old, the old strategy and they don't want to give it up. As for the U.S. and fiscal restraint, go figure. You read the newspapers as well as I do, so that's not going to be so easy to do. Um, explicit debt restructuring, uh, huge problem there, worries about moral hazard. But I think perhaps even more important with respect to debt restructuring, explicit debt restructuring. Face up to it. You're only going to get half a loaf. You're not going to get the full loaf. You're only going to get half of it. Face up to it. N nobody wants to do that. It's too hard. The electorate doesn't want to hear about it. Um, and some of the very practical problems, particularly in the States, but other countries too, are overwhelming 
You know, if you've got three million foreclosures a year, how do you sit down with people individually and do a deal? Um, sovereign restructuring in Europe, uh, it, what do you say? You're bringing uh, coals to Newcastle, do you know that expression? You're far closer to it than I am. The real worry from the start has been contagion. And so, you know, Greece didn't have a re debt restructuring problem. Now they've taken a haircut of 70% for the private sector people. But they're saying Greece is unique. Greece is unique, so we needn't worry about it spreading to somebody else. My real worry here is that the unwillingness to get a hold, get ahead of the contagion thing, has basically put everybody behind the contagion thing. And the worry would be that orderly, orderly uh, write-downs would turn into disorderly write-downs. Stronger investment spending, all sorts of reasons why that's not going to happen. Uh, perhaps the most important one is the Hayekian reason. You know, that if people save too little in the past, I mean, Axel's here, you can tell me that I'm wrong, but my interpretation of the basic Hayekian insight is that if people save too little in the past, They've now got, they don't have the wherewithal to spend the next period. And the people who should be doing the investment today to prepare for the consumption tomorrow won't do it because there won't be any consumption tomorrow. This is a fundamental problem. I'm not, I honestly have no answer for it. And then there's all sorts of other reasons why people don't invest, not least of which is political rhetoric. And I live right next to the Alsace basically saying it's the business class that got us into this, and the more we can screw the business class, the quicker we'll get out of this crisis, which is just not true. Anyway, uh, my last structural reforms, vested interests, all of this stuff can happen, but it's not going to be easy. And I just finish by noting that the, the political stakes here are, are enormously high. Um, I think this crisis could actually run on longer than the normal one, which you know, the normal financial crisis tends to run on for a long time. I think there's reason for this to, to uh, believe that it may be even worse. The political discontent is already starting. I mean, we've had references here to, you know, the Arab Spring, the Occupy Wall Street movement. Virtually every government in Europe has been changed since the whole thing began. Uh, the Obama campa campaign depends on what happens to the economy. There's just huge uh, political fallout from all of this stuff. And the worry is that when people are confronted with complex problems, a complex economy governed by a complex government apparatus that is very that's operating under very, very important constraints, there is this awful tendency for people to go for the simple solution. And somebody said something about H.L. Mencken earlier on here. Mencken once said, for every complex problem, there's a simple solution, and it's wrong. And people in Europe, for example, could be convinced that if we weren't in the euro, we wouldn't have our problems, which is true. But what doesn't follow logically is if you get out of the euro, you leave your problems behind. That's a very different thing. But people could come to believe it. And globally, um, I guess my worry is that the way forward is a cooperative way forward, absolutely. It's the only way we're going to get out of this and get half a loaf out of a, in a very difficult situation. But history shows us that we often don't get that cooperation. So if the Chinese and the Americans decide that it's more confrontation and cooperation, we have a problem. The Japanese and the Chinese, exactly the same thing. And I finish with a quote from Sir Arthur Salter. Uh, in 1934, who was the UK finance Sherpa. And what he said was, to face the troubles that beset us, this apprehensive and defensive world needs now above all the qualities it seems for the moment to have abandoned, courage and magnanimity. And when he made that point, he was directing it really to the creditors. And the big irony today is that the people who are the debtors then are the creditors now. And I hope they're all listening to Sir Arthur Salter. <clears throat> Thank you, William White. Um